Okay, this will be our last session, and I'm going to move to lesson 17, breaking down the problem. I think this is a very important uh, segment in our teaching. That's why I wanted to go ahead and uh, address this because we've got limited time here today. Breaking down the problem. So there are several aspects to nearly every problem. And uh, we're, we're at the section, uh, Lesson 17, Breaking Down the Problem. Surface problems usually indicate something beneath the surface is present there that needs to be dealt with. Maybe an attitude or an action, uh, such as relational conflict between family, in-laws, neighbors, co-workers. It might be pornography or substance abuse. Could be explosive fits of anger, sleeplessness, procrastination, physical problems, depression, stealing, uh, physical abuse, cheating, financial mismanagement. And these are just some suggestions that we might consider uh, dealing with this. So um, these uh, surface causes are often the things that may have triggered the most recent episode. A person who has a fit of anger may have responded to someone cutting him off in traffic or you know, running him off the road or something like that, or maybe it was bad service at a restaurant. But uh, uh, there may be certain settings or things that seem to trigger this kind of behavior, and they may appear to be part of the cause for this type of behavior. So the real cause for such behavior is most likely something that's deepered within them. Amen. Um, there are underlying attitudes. All actions are based on an attitude, and it's helpful to discover some of the underlying whys for people's behavior. For instance, uh, for instance, when counseling or dealing with someone, the problem may be lying, but the underlying attitude may be a fear of man. That's causing them to lie. Uh, in other words, they sense they're going to be rejected. So instead of telling the truth, hey, uh, they make up a false story to try to keep from having to experience what they think will happen. Might be rejection, perhaps. Something like that. Um, the problem may be stealing, uh, which is another example. But the underlying attitude might be laziness. The reason they steal is they just don't want to work. They don't want to do anything. And so we have to be willing to look at the surface issue and then try to uh, follow it down into the core issue that's really producing this bad fruit in their life. We're at Lesson 17, just a little beyond where we were. And I wanted to jump to this because we have limited time. And I, just, I think this is a real good section that I just wanted to share with you here publicly. Lesson 17 called Breaking Down the Problem. And right now we are just now about to point D. Just prior to point D, the last statement there says the problem might be inconsiderateness of others, but the underlying attitude may be a lack of appreciation for one's dependency on others. So again, what we've said up to this point as you're coming in this, morning, this afternoon is that usually the, the surface symptom that people come in with is usually an indicator of a deeper problem. And so what we want to do is, is to try to follow that symptom into understanding what really is motivating them or what's causing them to, to uh, act the way that they do, what's prompting their negative behavior. So uh, what we're saying, in effect, is that there are root problems or causes. The root problem is usually much deeper and is usually the, the cause of a multitude of other problems that are uh, tied to the same root. It's just like if you're looking at a tree, and on top of the surface is the tree and then all the branches and leaves, but underneath there, there's this root system down there. And in this root system, it, it is greatly determining how fruitful the tree is. Uh, if, if, the, if the root system you know, is not uh, healthy and everything, then the tree's not going to be healthy up above the surface. And this is what happens in people's lives because down under the surface, they've got root problems. Then up above the surface, what we all see, we see the, we see the manifestation of that bad, that bad root problem. And it may be, you know, uh, it may be sometimes it can be several different types of problems or behavior. 
caused by one root problem uh, sometimes. So the fruit in a person's life is indicative of the root that is feeding or inspiring it. If we do not deal with the root, then we're only going to be trying to manage the behavior or changing the person. It's kind of like doctors who uh, treat symptoms of problems that they know they cannot cure. They'll treat the symptom to make you feel better and to try to help you at least have as, as good of a life as you can. Realizing that you have a root problem that is eventually, you know, going to, it, it, may, it may take your life or it, may, it, or it may just cause you to have, you know, this continual production of bad fruit. So they try to help you with the symptoms. And a lot of times, uh, all we're doing is, if we don't understand counseling and how the Word of God works, uh, all we're really trying to do is just treat symptoms. And that, that's, uh, that's temporary best. Uh, I've, I've said before, sometimes you see Christians that, uh, particularly in certain uh, veins of Christianity, that will go to the altar repeatedly over and over and over. And that's a great thing to do. Uh, but why are they coming back to the altar over and over and over again for the same problem? Why isn't it working? Why isn't the prayers being answered? Why isn't the, the, the issues in their life being corrected? It's probably because they need more intense ministry. Amen. Not to minimize what can happen in the altar. God can do powerful things in the altar. But to also recognize that sometimes people, uh, people need a process of, of, of deliverance or healing, in other words. And that's going to really require some type of good counseling from a, a, a biblical counselor, hopefully. <clears throat> so um, Matthew chapter 3, verse 10 says, And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Um, th the truth of the matter is to get rid of bad fruit, you've got to deal with the root. Amen. Uh, or, or you're not going to get rid of it. Another good verse here is Matthew 7, 15 through 20. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes and thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but bad tree, the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree bear good fruit. Every time, uh, every tree, excuse me, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. So this is actually Jesus speaking here, and he's making a profound uh, statement and or observation here, uh, basically saying that when we look at ministers, when we look at leaders in the body of Christ, uh, we are responsible to determine their level of spirituality, not by how good they preach, not by even if they work signs and wonders and miracles, uh, but we're to determine the effectiveness of that person by their character, is what he's really saying. He's really saying is, is it's not just in how they minister, but how do they live? He said, that'll tell you what's down on, under beneath the surface. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Amen. Yes, amen. That's right. I'd rather see a sermon than hear a sermon. And that's wisdom right there. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, so there are common roots to a variety of problems. All behavior makes sense when you identify the root. The Bible refers to several roots of sinful behavior. So we're going to uh, just kind of look at this briefly here. Uh, the first one is the love of money. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So the love of money or the desire for wealth can cause people to compromise their standards and... Uh, and to alter their behavior in different ways. A love of money often transfers itself into a love for comfort, a love for ease, power, pleasure, and all other things that accompany wealth or money that money can buy. It's not saying, the Bible doesn't say money is evil. It says the love of money. 
And the implication is, is when money becomes so important to us, our love for it is so great that we're depending on money to meet our needs. Only God is the one that's supposed to meet our needs. And, and, and you know, this is something you often run into with counseling couples. One will say, well, she don't meet my needs. Well, he don't meet my needs. Well, I understand as good Christians and according to the Bible, we have a responsibility to, to serve one another, to meet one another's needs in the marriage relationship. However, those needs are really surface needs compared to the needs that only God can meet. If God's meeting all my needs, then uh, yes, I may desire for my spouse to you know, meet some other needs, but it won't be as big of an issue because the very root of the thing is not about what you do for me. It's about what can I do for you. And this is where Christianity has to, we have to be reminded that we are to be Christ-like. The scripture says Jesus came to serve, or it says to minister, not to be ministered to. And so really I live and you live for the benefit of other people. But our old flesh wants to say that, uh, hey, hey, you know, it, 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 if you're going to be in relationship with me, what can you do for me? You, you know, and so really that's not to be the idea at all. Um, here's the next one here, the love of self. And this is the one I, I touched on earlier today. So I'm going to take my time going through this so we'll cover it good. 2 Timothy 3, 2 uh, says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. And of course it goes on to say lovers of money, proud blasphemers, obedient to, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, uh, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people, the Bible says, turn away. So this idea of self-love is an issue that pervades nearly everything we do today. The language of self is the subject of many books and materials ranging from self-esteem to self-help to self-awareness to self-image to self-worth to personality identity to personal space and on and on and on. And unfortunately, <coughs> these, these heavily permeate Christian books even. Um, <coughs> pardon me. So there are those that say that we cannot love others until we properly love ourselves. Uh, but this statement itself comes from an attitude of selfishness and the desire to make selfishness sound like it's something spiritual that we all should do. Okay? So in order to come to the conclusion, um, they use one of the most... Oh, something's going on with my sound up here. Let me sit back down. It sounds better when I'm sitting. Maybe it's this. In order to come to the... Con that was what it was. So let me stand back up, okay? In order to come to this conclusion, they use one of the most often repeated statements in the Bible. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the text that a lot of people will use and try to, uh, you know, make, a, make a, a, a point of about loving self. But actually the conclusion that they draw from this is that you cannot properly love your neighbor unless you properly love yourself. This viewpoint is exemplified in such books as Love Yourself by Walter Trobisch. Uh, this is a book that was published by a Christian publisher. One, that, uh, one statement that is made in the book uh, is as follows. Uh, and this is a quote. It says, It was difficult for her to love others because she did not love herself enough. It is important for us to accept the other one as he is if we have not accepted ourselves as we are. So that's a quote from this book back in 1976. Uh, and it's important for us to know that the Bible never teaches this concept. Uh, it never teaches us to love ourselves. The solution to any problem that was addressed by Jesus or the apostles was never, you just need to love yourself more. They never said that. Jesus never said that. The Bible doesn't say that. Uh, the Bible presume, presumes that we do love ourselves, okay? Um, and that because we do, when it says that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, it means that we are to love our neighbor as we already love ourselves. In other words, it assumes we love ourselves. It, 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 for example, the Bible never says, uh, never, it, the Bible never gives any evidence of God. 
it assumes that he exists. From the very beginning in Genesis, it is written under the assumption that God exists. Now, it, it, it explains who he is and it explains, you know, the Trinity and all these things about God, his attributes and character and all these great things about God. But it never, ever answers the question, where did he come from? Who says there really is a God? It assumes that you, we already know that and believe it. And it's the same with love here. Um, it, 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 there's, there, there's this assumption that people love themselves because we are born into this world as human beings. And human nature is to always prefer self. Amen? Um, so when it says that we are to love our neighbor as, we, as ourselves, it means that we're to love our neighbor as we already love ourselves. And, and the example given here was, and where a lot, some people take this from now, is uh, uh, you know, the scripture we used earlier. But uh, listen to what Paul says about this issue right here. He says, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Uh, <clears throat> For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. So there's that assumption there that we, everybody loves themselves, you know. Um, and, and that's just understood. So when Paul indicated that men were to love their wives as Christ also loved the church, he was speaking of the same love that we are to demonstrate toward our neighbor. The love is characterized by this. It is an unconditional love. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says we can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for. And we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to selfish, selfless sacrifice. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatsoever to him. Amen. So that's the love of God. God doesn't say, let me, let me, let me decide if you're worth it. No, no. He, he has already predetermined that. Amen. Amen. So Christ's love was not earned or deserved by anything that we did or could potentially do for him. His love was demonstrated by dying so that we could live. His love was unconditional in the sense that there were no strings attached. Uh, it, he had no ifs attached to his gift of love. You know, he loved us before we ever chose to love him. Knowing that the majority of people that would be born and live on earth would reject him, would not return that love. Yet he loved them anyway. Amen. That's the kind of love God has. So it's a volitional love. Deuteronomy 7, uh, 7 through 8 says, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep uh, the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage. From the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So it was actually an act of his will. God didn't set standards and say, okay, Israel, you meet the requirements. So therefore I will love you. No, that's not what God did. God chose to love them because he chose to love them. Amen. And do you know that's what we do today? We love who we love because we choose to love them. And we should choose to love everybody. Hallelujah. Amen. But human nature says, I love me so much that if I don't like the way you treat me, I might not love you. You see what we base our decision on? I mean, I mean, in the flesh. In other words, uh, as Christians, we shouldn't do that. I don't think we do. But, uh, but that old human temptation says, you treat me right, then I'll treat you right. You love me good, I'll love you good back. Amen. Um, so, it was an act of God's will. He chose to set his love on us. It was a calculated and deliberate decision that he made. It was not a decision based on his emotions. It was not based on what we could do for him. There was nothing about be our beauty, our strength, our potential contribution to him that made him want us. It was based on the promises made and the covenants given in the past. So, um, God loves us because he wants to love us, because he chooses to love us. And we can choose to love everybody. Uh, I, that doesn't mean we're going to like the way they treat us or whether they love us back or not. But we can choose to love. What keeps us from loving others is the fact that uh, if we love ourselves more 
than, than, than what we should love ourselves, you know. Uh, then we're going to judge them based upon our own evaluation of ourselves. And here's the bad thing about that. We always favor ourselves. It's just the way it is, you know. Um, it's an intense love. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us and offering in a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Uh, an intense love is a love that gives itself and puts forth a strong effort. The truth is, is that you get out of a relationship what you put in the relationship. An intense love is ardent, strained, exerted to a high degree, unremitting, excessive, fervent, deep, and very strong. Think about it. How, and everybody really understands this. We just like to pretend like we don't. But you watch a young boy and a young girl who uh, start getting interested in each other. And the more in love they become with one another, the more they work at it. The, boy, I'm going to tell you what. I, it's like, uh, you know, we pretend to be, uh, we pretend to be somebody we're not. We, because we all of a sudden realize that we're not that great a person as we thought we were until we saw how awesome this person is. You know, that's what happens when you're infatuated. You think, oh, they're so wonderful. <gasps> they're so wonderful. And all of a sudden, yesterday we thought we were just amazing, and now we're going, oh, I hope I'm good enough. You know. And so what do we do? We have this temptation to start pretending to be something we're not. That's why a lot of times young people get into debt early. They want to buy a big, fancy, impressive car. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Not all the best clothes and everything. Why? Because they're shopping for a spouse, and they want it to look right and be tight. But the truth is, is that as soon as they get married, you know, they can't afford that car payment. Now they can't afford them fancy clothes. And, and now we got to adjust to all this because she's not who he thought she was and he's not who she thought he was. And we got a problem. And what was at the root of it? We really thought it was because our love for them was so great. But actually, we were really motivated by our love for ourselves. I love me so much that that's the person I'm going to get. That's the one I want, and I'll change me to get the person I want. And since I can't change me without God's help, that's when I start going to the bank and borrow money. That, you know what I'm saying? It's the funniest thing, but it is what it is. It, 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 we, we see this in our society. Uh, a lot of divorce takes place today, and, 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 and there's, there's always guilty people and victims. You know, in other words, I'm not here to... To comment on that, I, I, God just wants you restored, and He wants to heal you, and He wants you to go on and have a good life, right? Uh, and uh, all that. But notice what happens a lot of times. You can, sometimes you can see when there's problems in a marriage, because you'll see one or the other of the spouses, not just the obvious things like spending more time away from home and things like that, but they start working out. They go on a diet. They'll comb their hair different or something. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, they changes start transpiring that triggers and says, hey, what's going on here? Not that those are not good things to do. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that they start changing because they want something else in life than what they've had. Uh, and what do we do? We love ourselves so much, we'll make sacrifices to get what we want that we wouldn't make that would have possibly saved that marriage. If I'd be as nice to my wife as I am to my mistress, hello, I wouldn't be complaining about my wife ain't making me happy. You know it's true. You know, so at the root of it, what's the problem? The root of it is it, we love ourselves. And that love for ourselves is like drugs or alcohol. We get high on ourselves to the point that we start believing I can have what I want and since I think this is not what I want, how many people get a divorce and then want to come back? That happens to quite a bit. If you're a counselor, you know that. Uh, or they, they realize, I've, I've had this said to me quite a few times, six months after the divorce. If I'd have known what this was going to really be like, I'd have never left her or him. I've had that said to me quite a few times where they come back later. They're the one who left them. They're the one who initiated. They're the one who, and then all of a sudden, but you see what's going on. They're still all about loving themselves. I loved myself out of that relationship and marriage. And now I'm six months down the road and I hadn't been able to love myself into that dream that I had. 
I'm more unhappy now. Now I'm saying what I have was better than nothing. But you try to tell somebody that in, up front before it all breaks up. It's hard to do it. It's like counseling young couples. Um, uh, you know, a few times over the years, I've had a precious young girl grow up in church. She's just adorable, loves Jesus, everything. And uh, all of a sudden, she starts dating a boy at school, high school maybe, or college. And he, he just no runaround boy. You know what I'm talking about. And he ain't even seen the inside of a church since the last time somebody died. And, uh, <coughs> but all of a sudden, it starts off good. She says, if you want to date me, you've got to go to church. She's taking a stand. Well, he starts coming to church. And uh, at first, you know, most of the time, I hope parents are smarter, but uh, pastors definitely are. And they'll see him, and the, the guy, he's coming in church, and, and I've even seen them go so far as they're, boy, they're just so serious about God. You know, they're singing, and they're raising their hands, and they're just worshiping the Lord in church. And it looks like, man, this young man is going to really turn. And I've seen some do turn out to just be awesome. But the majority, I hate to have to say it, the majority, the day after they say I do, he ain't stepping in church again until somebody dies. You know, and he goes right back to running with the people he used to run with. He goes right back to his old habits. And she, this sweet little girl, is at home and she's devastated because the guy she married is not the guy that she's living with now. You know, people love themselves enough to make sacrifices to get what they think will make them happy. Hello. But sometimes... It's difficult to get them to make the effort and the sacrifice to do what will really make them happy. Amen. And only the power of God can really do that. That's why we have so, so much of a repeat, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to say offender because that, that deals mostly with the, you know, legal system. But uh, uh, you know what I mean. People fall back into old patterns of life. It's because of that. It's not because God's power is, is not effective. It's because we're still struggling with loving ourselves, you know. And everything like that. So, um, yeah, it's love is the key to everything. Paul said love never fails, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But uh, <clears throat> this, this, this thing, is, it's like an, un, it's an unending love. Amen. Paul said, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers... Uh, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. This is the love God has for us. God's love is unceasing. You know, uh, God will give up on you. You know, uh, basically, you have to give up on Him and resist Him, uh, because God just He just won't let go. Uh, there's this song, and I'm sure that y'all at least heard it on the radio, maybe. Uh, and we sing it in our church here sometimes on Sunday. And it talks about God's, it says in there, God's, it's talk about God's reckless love. And boy, that upsets me every time they sing that to the point to where I told Laurie, I said, you know, let's change that. And so they change it to God's precious love. And the reason is, is because theologically it's wrong. God's love has never been reckless. God don't do anything recklessly. God is not emotionally out of control. God is not just, you know, flipped over, heels overhead about anything. God is so wise and he is so balanced. And God's love is not reckless. It is strategic. It is specific. It is deliberate love. God says, I've got you in my target and I'm going to get you. I'm going to win you. Amen. It, God's love is precious. God's love is deliberate, amen. It is not reckless. And then there's another song, and they're beautiful songs, don't get me wrong. I just, I just, it bothers me when little points of theology are way off base. Another one talks about, it talks about, you know, some worship song, and it talks about, um, uh, he, he, he kisses me with a, 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 um, a sloppy wet kiss. Y'all know that song? You've heard it on the radio. A sloppy wet kiss. Uh, come on, you know, <laughs> that sounds so juvenile, doesn't it? it? It sounds like something teenagers in the back of the car are doing that shouldn't, they shouldn't be doing. And that's not God at all. You know, God is not some little starry eyed teenage 16 year old who just fell in love for the fifth time this week. You know, that's not it at all. God's love is so 
incredible and so powerful. It is a committed love. It's not based on emotions. Even when you don't kiss God back, let's just use their terminology, God still, it loves you in ways you cannot imagine. Amen. Oh, I love the Lord. He's so good. Amen. Um, <clears throat> To know God's love, it takes a humble position in life. We, we've got to be willing that, to understand this kind of love means dying to self on a daily basis. What God, when God asks us to do anything, He never asks us for His benefit only. He always, that's because of His love for us. He always has in mind what's best for us. When, when we were, all of us looked like we're old enough to have kids that have driven or something, if you had kids. And for all of us, you know, kids want to start driving when they're 14, you know. No, 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 you know. Uh, but when, even when they first start driving, you know, we still want to tell them, well, you know, you need to be in by this time. You need to be careful with this, you know. Why? Because you ain't been experienced. You're, well, you're just, you're just overbearing, Dad. Dad, you just won't let me do it. No, I want you to be around next year. Hello, why? Because I love you. Well, immaturity doesn't always understand that. And so a lot of times people, we, we feel like that, that uh, God is asking too much, you know. Uh, but in actuality, he loves us so much that he will ask us to not love ourselves beyond what is, you know, scripturally best for us. Because when we do, we make bad decisions, Amen. We think about what's best for us and not what's best for God and others and the environment. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the living environment and things of that nature. Um, so it's about God's love. God's love is, is a pur purposeful love. Amen. Uh, he works for our improvement. He has a vision of what we can be. He found us one way, but he is going to love us into a glorious condition. And I love that about God. God's not going to beat us in line. God's not going to slam us in the corner, you know, and make us face the corner until we finally admit we were wrong. No, God's going to love us. He's going to love us. He's going to love us. God, God's attributes, he is patient. He is long-suffering. God is merciful. He's compassionate. Yes, he does require us to admit when we've sinned. He wants you to say, yeah, I messed up. I'm sorry. God, please forgive me. And God says, I'm already loving that out of you. Amen. But he needs us to participate and cooperate in the process. Why? Because it needs to be transforming. If God always run around behind us sweeping up our mess and hiding them, from, you know, we just keep making messes with our life. But God loves us and he says to us, Hey, if you acknowledge you made a mistake there, and now trust me before you make the next decision, before you make another bad, you know, pick or choice, God says, then, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll fix this for you, and we'll go on from here, and we'll get, you'll see a better life. Amen. So these are just things about in counseling. Love is so powerful, and it's so life-changing. Amen. Um, we don't have a very big church here. Um, we've got 25 people probably on Sunday mornings, but we're, because we, we're only three years old, but we didn't, actually we had twice as many people. and We dwindled back down, people moving to other parts of the Metroplex or out of the country. But what I'm trying to say is, is that over the three years, uh, we've, we're down to about 25 right now, but we have the most phenomenal time together on Sundays at, at noon. We meet at 12, and uh, some of our people actually go to church somewhere else and then come over. But uh, we will, um, we just kind of have a philosophy that the church is supposed to be a place of freedom and love and acceptance, you know. And so we come in, and you know, you can tell with me, I, I don't mind talking, you know. But I, I only preach about once a month. And the people in the congregation take turns coming up and speaking. And some of them are teachers and some are preachers and some are just exhorters. We take turns who's going to do the offering, who's going to do the, the worship. And it, we have the most wonderful time. And then you know what we do that's kind of weird? But because we love the Lord and we just love being together, after church is over, I'd say, I'd say 80 or 90% will sit and we discuss, whoever spoke, we discuss what they talked about. And it's the most exciting time. It's weird, I know, because I've never had church like this before, uh, but it's like, you know, we're kind of like, people are tired of that other stuff. And we just got a new couple that just started coming. They've been here about a month now, and uh, they left a wonderful church. Matter of fact, it's, 
It's a great church. And uh, they came over and they joined our church and we don't even have a membership. You know, we just say, if you come, you're part of us. And, you know, you know, and if you, when you come, you're part of us. That, you know, in other words, we don't try to put bondage on people. So they said, you know, we, we, the first Sunday we were, came in here, they, we said it was, it was so, there was so much freedom, we almost didn't know what to do. You know, well, I'm not trying to brag on our church. What I'm trying to say is, is that I believe this is what people are hungry for because people are tired of being uh, put, like I said, people are tired of religion trying to shove them into a mold that says, if you're going to be with us, you've got to look like this. Yeah. And then the down, on the other side of the street says, if, well, if you're going to be, be with us, you've got to look like this. To the point we, we spiritualize the mold. The mold becomes more important than the goal, which is being like Jesus, you know. And so we almost come across as though you're spiritual when you are like us. Ain't nobody wants to be like me and nobody wants to be like you. You understand what I'm saying? We want to be unique as God created us. Yes, we want to have the freedom, the blessing that God's kingdom offers to us, but we just want to be who Jesus created us to be. And there's so much freedom and liberty in that, but it's hard to find. It's hard to find. Well, I shared that with you to say that if you approach counseling that way, the Holy Spirit is already the real counselor. And when you give people liberty to change the, 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 the things that are stopping their progress, the things that are causing them to fall and stumble, you give them liberty to change, it's really what they came looking for anyway. But it's just that so many times in the past, we have tried to package it in ways that they just couldn't grasp. You know, yeah, I want Jesus, but I don't want all that other mess you got attached to him. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I remember back in the 60s, some of you may be old enough to remember this. I was uh, a child, you know, I was, I was one in 1960. So, uh, so in the 60s, I was a child. 70s was my teen years, okay? But I remember in the 60s and in the 70s, uh, you know, that's when we had all the hippies, you know. We had the long hairs and the, and the afros, and y'all know all that stuff. Remember all that? Uh, believe it or not, I had an afro. But uh, <laughs> I did. My wife can show you pictures. Even when we got married, I still had one. My hair used to be more wavy. And so I, because it was wavy, but it wasn't enough, I'd give me a big old perm and let it grow and it'd get real big. And by the end of summer, it'd part and hanging like this. Anyway, my kids just laugh at me when they see that. But um, anyway, getting back to the point here, the story. Uh, we had masses of people saved on the beaches of California and all over, the, all over the world, but really in the United States. And they called it the Jesus Freaks. You remember that? And, and of course, now they, they label it the Jesus Movement that happened in the 60s. But thousands of young people, hippies and, you know, the whole thing, uh, were, have been in the drug culture, get saved, get set free. But the churches everywhere said, you can't come in here. All across America, the churches are praying for souls, and when they kind of come in their church, they go, if you're going to come in here with that long hair, don't come back next week. If you're going to come in here with them hippie sandals on, don't you come back next week. You can't be wearing no faded blue jeans in here. I mean, this is the way it was back then. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And literally, those people were pushed back out of the church. But here's the funny thing. You do a little bit of research and you'll find out that some of the biggest churches in America today are pastored by former Jesus freaks that got saved in the 60s or early 70s. Isn't that crazy? Because they encountered Christ in an environment that was accepting of them like they were, loving them, not, not criticizing and judging the things that didn't matter. Jesus don't care how long your hair is. You know what I mean? Uh, he really don't. But you couldn't convince the traditional church during that time. Today, I think we're beyond that. But, but uh, these were issues that had to be dealt with. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about someone coming in here half naked. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Um, and so we, we're, we're, we're growing as a church and as a body. But we've got, I'm falling off myself here. We've got to um, focus on letting people be who they are, and then bringing, presenting to them the love of Christ in a way that they can take it and that it can help them to f f 
begin a life journey that's unique to them and the Lord. Amen. And what's so, what's so unique about it is, is the most unlikely people we were talking about in the 60s are now today some of the senior leaders in some, of, some, some phenomenal churches in America. The people that were rejected, the people who, who the church said, no, you know, you can't come in here. I don't care if you say you got saved. I don't care if you got baptized. You, ain't come, you can't come in here until you get in our box. You know, and it, it was a sad thing. But anyway, we're learning from it, aren't we? Praise God. Um, Christ's love always works for our improvement. And uh, God's love is a unique kind of love. The Greek word, of course, we know is agape. And it's, it's the kind of love, agape love, we, sometimes we define it as the God kind of love, okay? Which really doesn't tell you a whole lot unless you understand God's love. Um, but what it is, it's an unconditional love. It just says, I love you, and, and, and I just want to see you get better. Not, not man's standards are better, but biblical standards are better, amen, which deals with character. It deals with the condition of the heart, amen. It deals with growing spiritually and maturing spiritually anyway. So um, I'm going to move from that because this is, there, there's a lot uh, more in this. Um, the Bible teaches us that there are several many, many things that we can look at and we can understand about the love of God. But in order to really grasp the love of God, we've got to evaluate our love for ourselves. Because if we are loving ourselves to the point to where we have really become the idol or the God in our life, it's all about me and it's not about the Lord, then we got a problem, don't we? You know, uh, I thought about sometimes somebody ought to preach a sermon called Me, Myself, and I. You know, because that's a lot of where America is today. It's all about me, you know. Um, yeah, so um, there are many things that can compound a person's problem in life. And I'm down in Roman numeral number two, a page or two over. Uh, it says there are many things that can compound a person's problem. There are lifestyle issues. And I'm not going to even, even read every one of the single points. I'm going to cover the, the headings because you can, you can see them and you also can pretty well, you know them. Uh, there are stress factors. Uh, obviously, different things can impact us and can bring extra stress that we weren't anticipating or weren't, that wasn't in our life prior to this need for counseling. Um, then there can be physical issues. They can be uh, physiological changes. Just part of growing as a human can bring about some hormonal changes and some physical changes, and people may need some help. Uh, they, may need, they may have some physical problems like can't sleep and things of that nature. Then there's some complex problems that have to be broken down into smaller parts. And that would involve uh, identifying specific problems. Um, specific problems can lead to specific solutions. Generalization needs to be clarified by the, by the counselee. Examples of what we mean by this is that uh, if, if, if the wife says he doesn't love me, well, what does she mean by that? You know, does she mean he, he didn't do what I asked him to do last week? And so now, therefore, she's saying he doesn't love me. Or does she really mean that he doesn't love me? You know, uh, sometimes we have to clarify things because sometimes people will generalize things. Well, he makes me mad. Okay, is that like 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Or, or is there one issue that we need to talk about? These are just some things that have to be uh, considered. And so there's several other examples there. Then you come over here and we give you the sins of the last days according to 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. And we actually read that verse a few, just a, a little bit ago. And so that's broken down for you here. And it is amazing how if you will, when you have time, just read through it. It is amazing how uh, it just describes our world today. And this is why people have so many problems and so many emotional issues is because, uh, number one, they're stuck on themselves. Uh, they're not in the right relationship that they need to be with and, and, in, and in the right set of, having the right set of priorities as God has designed and desired. Uh, number two, if that shouldn't be number one, those two are fighting for each other. So, you know, it's, it's going to produce that kind of fruit. And we've got to deal with the root of the problem. Symptoms will lead us to understand what the fruit is. It's kind of like um, when I see a tree and it's got green leaves, I may say, I don't know if that's an apple tree or a peach tree. But give me a time. Give me some time. And the more I spend time with this tree, I'm going to see either a fuzzy pink peach 
or a pretty red shiny apple. And I'm going to say, okay, that gives me an idea of what's going on underneath the ground. Okay. There's been some things sown that have produced a root system that is able of sustaining this tree. And now I can identify it by the fruit it's producing. Okay. It's an apple because the seed was an apple. Well, there's seeds of bitterness and unforgiveness. There's all kinds of seeds of jealousy and envy and strife. And all these seeds, when they first start coming up, you know, we can identify that, you know, there's something growing here. There's something going on here. But eventually, they're going to produce fruit. And when they start to produce fruit, then we can say, okay, now we know maybe what we need to look back at and consider a little more of what we need to do. Um, that concludes that session. You know what I'm going to do? <clears throat> Because uh, we only have 10 minutes left, um, I'm going to stop right here. Because it'll be, I'm going to have to go home now, and, and the sections I skipped over in, the, in here, and then this sections I haven't got to yet, I'm going to have to go home and teach those on video. So if you're interested, like I said, the whole lesson will be on video uh, in two or three days, and you can go back and watch the video if you want to. Um, at the very least, you, you definitely need to read it all. Read through it and do your test, and your test will take you back through it as you've already learned, okay? Anybody got any discussion or questions? We have 10 minutes, so if you want, if you want to. If you don't, that's great, too. Does anybody have any questions uh, about um, the process? You know, this is still early in the year, so if you're struggling, if you're, not, if you're having problems with the software or something, maybe we can answer some questions there. Okay, when you, um, when you complete a test it should, and you hit submit, it should tell you your score right there. Um, there is not a way that you can go into the software and actually look at your record of courses or what have you. But what you can do is you can, um, actually what we normally do, and I obviously failed to do this, is we normally give, we normally uh, email to students, a, uh, it says student record. And we ask you to write down your grade you got, the name of the course, and the date that you took it. Because we get a lot of phone calls. Uh, how many more courses have I got to do? You know, uh, well, what grade did I make on this one? And so we have to, it takes effort for us to get that information. But we get it and we give it to you. So what I'm saying is, is I can get it to you. Um, but normally we, we give people one of these. But typically we give these more for online students because... Uh, they're the ones who really call the most, <laughs> you know, because they don't have an opportunity. Yes. No, our software doesn't give us that, that benefit. It, it gives us that benefit. We have your, 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 your grade book, you know, that it automatically puts your grade in and tells us what course it is and everything. But what, what I'm saying is, is I can give that to you. I, I can make a copy of that and email it to you. And, no, I'll, I'll be happy to. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so that, but that is a good question. She was asking if there was a way to go online and look at the test grades and, and everything that she's done. And my answer was, is not for your side. It, on our side, we have that. And if you need that, you can just request that, and we can, we can send you that information. Like if you're wondering... Yeah, you can. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, so after you, after you submit it and get your test grade, then you, uh, then you can print that. Oh, yeah, you can print it okay. if you want to. You can print the whole test. Uh, you can even, uh, if you'll look more closely before you just go, you know, quit and quit, uh, you can go in back and look and see what you missed. It'll let you do stuff like that. You can even take the test again. If you're not happy with your grade, you can take the test again, you know. Yeah. It's intentionally that way. I mean, those are options we have, and we chose to make it, because our objective is for you to learn. Our objective is not for you to go feel like, oh, no, uh, you know, I only made this. No, we just want you to learn, you know. Um, and so, um, but for most people, most people make a good grade the first time they go through it, because it's, it's really set up to succeed. When I was praying about designing this whole program, some of the ideas I took from the place I used to work years ago at Clarion. Uh, but that place never was online. This was, that was before, you know. 
And so everything we did was through the post office. People had to mail in their tests. We had to mail you. Uh, uh, we started off with cassettes. And then we went to, DV, uh, not DVD, CDs. And a uh, lot of work, running off CDs all the time. Yeah, you get the point. Anyway, everything was so slow, you know. And, uh, but that's the way everybody did it then. Yeah, so anyway. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, we won't see you until... You won't see me until January, so yes. Happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas to y'all. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Young couples, I'm wondering, because I'm an older person, older single person, is there a difference in the way people react to counseling if they're older or younger, or is everybody kind of the same in your opinion? No. People's reactions always are based on their life's experiences. People who uh, are older are, it's not, it's not in any way to be, uh, well, I think you understand what I mean. Uh, they, they just live longer and they know more, <laughs> you know, and so their questions are different. Their um, experiences, their own uh, growing and learning have taught them a lot, and so when they come for counseling, uh, I personally think the, the older a person is when they come for counseling, and especially Christian people, uh, the more benefit they get because they've already got a lot of wisdom and life experience. And so their thoughts are more, they spent more time thinking through processes. They've already learned a lot of what works and don't work. So they're, com- they're, they're coming with some really good insight and desire to, to ask some really good questions. You know what I mean? And, uh, and plus, they've learned the value of someone else helping them. You know, young people have, and we're, we were probably all this way, young people have a tendency to feel like they know more than they realize they didn't know until they get older. You know, I look back at when I was young, and pff, I thought I had the world by the tail, you know. But I didn't realize it had me by the neck. <laughs> but, uh, and it was hard to talk to me, you know. Uh, it was, I can, I, I'm, I'm just being honest. It was hard to tell me anything because I already knew everything. Bless God, you know.